Hello and welcome to Forgotten Fronts, to the second episode of our Scourge of War Get Expert Let's Play. In this episode we'll be playing the second scenario, called Boys Got Their Dander Up, the first in the stock game, where we take command of Buford's 1st Cavalry Division with a detachment of the 2nd US Artillery. Just like in the Scourge of World Waterloo playthrough, I have also modified this game, but only with visual mods and different scenarios, nothing that will actually change the game. And now for the background of the scenario. If you don't want to hear this, a time will come up to go directly to the scenario. Wait for it. Now! John Beaver's 1st Cavalry Division, our 2900 troopers, were under the command of William Gamble and Thomas Devon. On the first day of the Battle of Gettysburg, they were attacked by men from James Archer and Joseph Davis's brigades, numbering 3,438 men from Henry Heath's division. Buford's cavalry was deployed in three lines. In last episode, we saw the first and second line at Marsh Creek and Hare Ridge, which was attacked with skirmishers. Today we will see the defense of McPherson's and Seminary Ridges, just west of Gettysburg. However, not all of Buford's troopers were facing the Confederates. As some of them watched the roads to the east and north, others weren't even in combat roles, with one in four men holding the horses for the others, leaving Buford with around 1,800 troopers. The cavalry, however, made up for this with their breech-loading carbines, which had a higher rate of fire than rifled muskets that most of the Confederates would be armed with, firing four to seven shots to every two to three from the rifled muskets. They could also be fired in better cover, as they could be fired lying down. One disadvantage they did have, however, was that they were less accurate. The earlier skirmishing gave Buford plenty of time to set up his defenses and bring up his artillery of six guns under Lieutenant John Califf. They were deployed spread out to trick the Confederates into thinking that they had more men than they did. However, after the early morning skirmishes, Heath became frustrated when he only traversed two miles within two and a half hours, and so committed the rest of Archer's brigade. Archer, however, was concerned that it was a trap, and requested the support of another brigade, and got it from Davis's brigade. Davis's brigade was far larger than Archer's, but Davis was an inexperienced political commander. He was related to the President of the Confederate States, Jefferson Davis, calling him Uncle Jeff, and so the two brigades advanced. Archer on one side using the obstacles to his advantage, and Davis on the other using the open ground and his numbers as his advantage. Welcome back to those of you who didn't want to hear the history. General Buford has descended from the cupola of the Lutheran Seminary, and a courier approaches with a report. General Buford, my scouts have reported the rebels have reorganized and are forming up for another assault. As requested, I'm moving my brigade to support Gamble on the turnpike. First thing I do is to take command of all of my subordinate commanders as they move around their units on their own, which is not helpful when they move them out of defensive positions. As you see now. In the distance you can see the approach of Davis's brigade over the open ground. While returning my troops to their defensive positions, I call for Devon's troops to form a reserve, which will be vitally important in the coming battle. Generally they take the road which takes twice as long, but I tell them to go over land, even though they'll lose some stamina, passing obstacles. I also put some troops in the center, as there is a good defensive position there and the Confederates are likely to attack there. But then another courier approaches with welcome news. General Buford, my leading division of my corps has arrived just northeast of Gettysburg and will march to your support. But just as the helpful orders come through, the Confederates make their move. With Davis's brigade approaching, I quickly move my troops into defensive positions. Keep low, boys. Take cover behind the fence. Wait until they cross the stream, then open up on them. 
with troops in defensive positions on my left flank and reserves in place in case anything goes awry. I move over to the right flank. On the way, I move the units moving to our center to support our left flank. But knowing that those troops will be exposed, I move up cannons to support them, planning to catch the rebels between the two houses to hopefully bottleneck them and then hit them with canister fire. But in the meantime, the rebels make their move, as we see Archer's Brigade advances in the background. Moving back to the left flank, units on our left check the units attacking our left. Another unit comes to attack our center, but thankfully I was prepared as I sent units there previously. I was trying to move the West Virginia cavalry into position, but it was a bit finicky. It should be worth to mention that the flag is what the unit counts as, and saying this I mean Moving the flag, it, the flag icon into cover of, say, the fence post means that the unit's in cover. Never mind that the actual soldiers themselves are actually behind the fence. This is how I can get away with some really interesting moves, especially when I'm moving units up to the turnpike, as we'll see in a minute. Quickly deciding that this idea was terrible, I moved the cannon to support our center instead. But then the 8th Illinois Cavalry was confronted with the entirety of Archer's Brigade. But having no fear in the face of the enemy, they advanced towards them, with their chins held high. Or I just left the commander on the island. In the meantime, I move up the cannons to the far left flank with the support of Caliph to attempt to pin the Confederates down with shell fire. But noticing how this keeps our entire left flank exposed, I search around the map for some more cavalry. Finding the 6th New York, swiftly moving them into position in column. In the meantime, the 12th Illinois become overzealous and advance past the defense force, and they have to tell them to move back. Just like they should, the U.S. Cavalry arrives just on time to halt the Rebel advance on our left flank.
As we advance into the flank, the Yankee cavalry prepared to fire. We heard the thunder and their hooves and the wheel of a cannon further up the bank. And we were quickly forced back into the river under an intense fire. I quickly told the cannon to focus fire on the 7th Tennessee in order to blast them back with canister fire. Things aren't going well for the Confederacy in, in another place as well, just left of center. As we can see, the entirety of Archer's Brigade is pinned down in the street. We thought we had the men just push by the, the cavalry, but as we got to the far bank of the street, the Yankee fire was so intense that our entire brigade was held down. Any attempts to look over the bank and die of a heavy fire upon One of the Confederate regiments on our right flank makes a really interesting decision to charge right across our lines. I believe they are attempting to charge the West Virginia Cavalry to get them out of the game, but then they charge the 3rd Indiana and quickly push them back. Then I notice a couple of cannons in the railway cut that aren't firing, so I move them into a nearby field and tell them to unlimber. Then I notice that I'm not capturing the point, and so move Buford forward into the capture area. But unless I move troops there, I won't be able to capture the point and gain victory point. But in the woods nearby is General Reynolds, which suggests that the first corps is not far away. I also move forward an army ordnance wagon in order to rearm my troops, as will become vital later on in this fight. Seeing the 3rd Indiana break, I send in Devon's brigade to shore up our right flank. The left has fallen, advancing form up on the fence along the street. In the meantime, on the right flank, the small West Virginia cavalry squadron will have to hold out until Devon's brigade arrives, holding out against one large Confederate infantry regiment with another coming up to support them. And so I move up Devon's brigade at the double. Here's a close-up of our brave boys, and of the pin Confederate infantry in the street. Both Archer's Brigade and the 8th Illinois have taken heavy casualties, only to get worse. And now I notice that some of our cannon are not unlimbering. This is probably because Caliph is under take command mode. So I go to the other cannons to make sure they're unlimbered. see that the 8th Illinois is not the only regiment holding off Archer's Brigade, but another is taking a cheeky pot shots into their flank as the generals of the Confederate Brigades try to get the men to go forward. While this is going on, I have cannons supporting my left flank, 
but they have no targets for some reason. And this problem will persist through the entire battle. Well, for most of the battle. Only to send more cannons to join them in their passive manner. In order to keep the Confederates down and move up another cannon to support our center. But then I noticed that Devil's Brigade and team even in cover, so I attempt to move them up. But this gets a bit messy as their formations are quite large. They cannot actually form a cohesive line near those houses. This is where the whole flag thing comes into play, as if a unit is overlapping another one. As long as the flags are not in front of each other, they can shoot through each other. With the two larger units moved up, I can now relieve the West Virginia cavalry and send them to the rear for some much needed rest. You've done more than what's expected of us this day. I wouldn't be surprised if there isn't some kind of medal for us after this. The Confederate regiment which advanced so far ahead under so little fire is now caught between two large regiments and will be cut to pieces by fire. Shoot at nothing for a while until later. Though the 8th Illinois is held violently, they have taken severe casualties, and so I have to reinforce them. And so I move up the 8th New York Cavalry. Though an inferior unit as a militia compared to season, they are far more numerous, and will keep the rebels pinned in theory. But the rebels quickly react as the fire stops for but a moment. The federal fire lessened for a moment, 
before resuming the set with less intensity, and at that moment the general sent us forward. Though I'm moving them to the capture point, the West Virginia Cavalry is too few in number to hold the capture point. That role will be taken up by the 8th Illinois Cavalry later on as I relieve them. You can see that one rider was a little zealous that I heard moving up by himself. And now I relieve the 8th Illinois Cavalry in both sides of the by sending them to the rear to recuperate and resupply. With, dwindling, with half morale, stamina, and low ammunition. But the rebels react quickly by advancing into our flank. And unfortunately, just to add on to this, the cannons are facing the wrong way round. A tactical genius I'll have in there. But luckily at the same time, the attack on our right has stopped, and so I can send the 17th Pennsylvania Cavalry to quickly counterattack against any rebel movements in our center and left. But then the first Tennessee moves forward with an attack line drawn directly to our cannon. Under intense fire, they move up at the double. And so I attempt to set up the cannon to stop them. Men unlimit the gun and commence fire. Sir, the Greybacks are coming right for us. Follow my orders. Sir, the limber is stuck. Men, get the gun out of here. I decide to retreat the gun back as the first Tennessee gets rather close. The 8th Illinois shifting position puts a lot of fire into their flank. I fold back the gun and then attempt to hold them back for the 12th Illinois. But seeing that they cannot hold either, I move up the 17 Pennsylvania to hold them by the railway cut. We were pushed back by the rebel infantry. As we mounted and withdrew, unfortunately the rebels were among our ranks and were knocked back by our horses. Others were cut down by sabers or shot with revolvers or carbines. However, as we made it past them, the Confederates fired upon us, killing several of our troopers and horses.
Moving back to our left flank, I noticed that the cannon are doing nothing. And so I decided to move them to see if they can actually get a target. However, I only got a target for a brief second, and then nothing again. But then all of a sudden the cavalry breaks, and so I have to move with another regiment. So I quickly rearm the 8th Illinois Cavalry and send them forward. Despite their previous advances and, ca and pushing back of our artillery and cavalry squadron, the first Tennessee is quickly forced back, exposed without any support. And you can see on our right that the Confederates are taking cover as they are under intense shell fire. And you can see that the rebels are beginning to break. And interestingly enough, one of them retreats towards our lines opposed to away. At the sight of our cannon preparing to fire a canister upon them. Checking to see if any of the units that broke had returned. I bring the 8th New York Cavalry back to the command point so we can continue capturing points as we still need 1,000 points at least to get a victory. But while in fighting these years, we saw a brief glimpse of the 1st Corps infantry coming to support us. I also grabbed the 12th in order to move them to the capture point, but I have no intention of using them quite yet as they have completely depleted stamina and halved morale and no supplies. I move up a squadron to shore up the hole in our line, as another attack through the woods is certainly possible. And just as I do, another Confederate regiment appears, as another general assault from the Confederates occurs. the other bank in the street, we came under an intense fire from the fence on top of the bank. But while getting into line many, the troops slipped on the rocks and slowed us down. Eventually we were forced back into the stream itself. And here you can see the attack of the 13th Alabama. They come in an intense carbine and canister fire as they come up the bank.
But then one of the Confederate regiments, cheaply enough, sneaks between our lines and endangers our cannon. Luckily enough, I have the 12th Illinois, which I quickly send back in order for a much more rested regiment to take command of the situation, the 1st Indiana Cavalry, to counterattack against them. However, on our right, things are beginning to look dicey as our units begin to fall back, but I quickly tell them to hold position. But then noticing how exposed they are and about to be fired upon on all sides, the rebels break, freeing up our center to open to continue as normal. And so I shuffle around my defensive line as the Confederates come for another attack, but then they don't, and most of the Confederates are falling back and breaking at this point. Even in the center, as I moved this unit up, which in retrospect was a badly damaged one, but I didn't notice this until later. And they begin to fire upon this regiment. And now the two most crucial pe people of the unit have to go all the way around that house in order for them to order for them the line to continue firing. Davis's troops begin to advance again on our right.
then I notice is a trap as some of another unit comes to attack our unit's flank. and another unit against it. And then a couple messages come in from Confederate couriers who were captured, urging the men of Davis's brigade forward to a devastating effect to the men in our center as they are quickly forced back. Then something really interesting happens as we find a Confederate general behind our lines, but not just any Confederate general, it's the division commander of Harry Heath. If we follow the map properly, we should be right about here. I see. And headquarters should be over. Oh. It's the Federal Cavalry. Quickly, furl the flag. Don't want to, and don't make any sudden moves. We might be able to sneak by them. And so off they go. And being in a generous mood, I decide to let them escape instead of attempting to charge them down. Here we see that the 1st Brigade, 1st Corps, if I got that correctly, is in position. So some units, including the poor batter 6 New York, you know they've done a damn good job so far. And I move a cannon to support our right in order to stop any Confederate advances with shell fire. Sir, where have you been? I've been requesting reinforcements for the past hour. Watch your tone while I'm just a senior officer. Davis, I've been, um, scouting the enemy positions. Yes. Noticing another Confederate regiment advancing. I attempt to move up in one of my cavalry in 
and attempt to do a charge against the Lord as they begin to lose cohesion rather quickly. But this is not Napoleonic cavalry. It's not heavy cavalry at all. It's absolutely light cavalry called the Dets, mainly used for shooting, not for charging, as most cavalry was used in the US Civil War. But as the battle slows down to a uh, stop for a few moments with only our artillery firing, I go around to all my cannons to tell them to prioritize infantry. And in the meantime, the 6th New York attempt to move up to form a defensive position. Bless our hearts, but I'm not going to put them in again because they're absolutely exhausted. With the two large Confederate infantry regiments on my right flank, I concentrate four of my guns to keep them pinned with shell fire, with Caliph in support. And here we can see some of the units of the 1st Brigade. A unit of Union Infantry and my personal favorite, the Zouaves. Then I collect some more of the cavalry in the background. But then, victory! We have successfully held McPherson's Ridge for 4,398 points, which is a major victory, as we only needed 1,500. You can see our cavalry regiments have done quite well, with Gamble getting 400 kills and both Devon and Caliph getting nearly 100. Going through the casualty list, it gets broken down even more between killed, wounded, and missing, and by which units, and what the weapons were, ammunition are, and conditions are right when the battle ended. I'll also be going over the artillery who've actually killed units.
now going over the Confederate units. But what does General Buford have to say of his troops in this most glorious day? On July 1st, between 8 and 9 a.m., reports came in from the 1st Brigade under Colonel Gamble that the enemy was going down from toward Cashtown in force. Colonel Gamble made an admirable line of battle and moved off proudly to meet him. The two lines soon became hotly engaged, and we, we having the advantage of position, he of numbers, the 1st Brigade held its own for more than two hours ha and had to be literally dragged back a few hundred yards to a position more secure and better sheltered. Tidball's battery, commanded by Lieutenant Califf of the 2nd U.S. Artillery, fought on this occasion as seldom witnessed. At one time, the enemy had concentric fire upon his battery from 12 guns, all at short range. Califf held his own, gloriously worked his guns, deliberately with great judgment and skill, with great and with wonderful effect upon the enemy. The first brigade maintains this unequal contest the first brigade maintains this unequal contest until the leading division of General Reynolds Corps came out to its assistance. While the left of the line was engaged, Devon's brigade on the right had his hands full. The enemy advanced upon Devon by four roads, and on each was checked and held until the leading division of the eleventh corps came to its relief came to his relief. The zeal, bravery, and good behavior of the officers and men on the night of June 30th and during June the 1st was commemorable in the extreme. A heavy task was before us, and we were equal to it, and shall all remember with pride, at Gettysburg we did our country much service. Brigadier General John Buford, 1st Cavalry Division. Ladies and gentlemen, it is hard to find a place in life that hasn't been improved by the technology of this modern age. For many of you, it would have been how you arrived this day, in carts powered by engines stamped with Watts Engine Company. And for others, it may have been how, how you found out through learning machines stamped with Babbage Electric. These machines and many others like them have improved the lives of all, from the noble workers to the royals of Europe. From the, to the royals of Europe. 
Machines our parents, never mind our grandparents, couldn't even imagine. Only glimpses of them could be found in fictional novels from the likes of Verne's and Wells. But if I were a betting man, I would, I would bet that none of you think of the cost of these advances outside of London, as a rays of the sun of empire have fared far worse with the dwindling wood and coal reserves that have drove many of the world powers to desperate acts, turning upon one another, allies becoming enemies, which frayed the bonds of peace until they snapped into the conflict the world is embroiled in today. We thankfully have been kept from these conflicts through the resources from our vast colonies abroad. However, they are endangered from outside and from within, from other powers like the annexation of British North America by the United States, and from within, with the high demand of coal and wood, the shifts the workers make have become far, far longer and more strenuous, leading to more strikes and extremist Luddite groups like the Breakers of Chains and Communists. But in response to these cries to see reason, the government creates groups like the Knights of the Realm, quashing their resistance from the shadows. In the name of the Sovereign and the Empire, open this door now! Do what he says. We don't want any trouble. You are all under arrest for denouncing the Empire. 